To Brown, the new discoveries far out in the Kuiper Belt only make the New Horizons mission more exciting. Pluto is the closest member of this new class of objects we're finding. Um, the next best thing to studying all of these objects out there is to go look at some of the big ones. Go look at Pluto. It's, it's not the biggest one out there, but it's the closest really big one that we can learn a lot about. So I, I think that going to Pluto is, is much more exciting today than it was even a year ago. So, after 75 years of long-distance Pluto studies, the action shifts to Cape Canaveral. New Horizons may be light and relatively small, but launching it to Pluto requires giant components. We know we've got that starting line out there, so there's a lot of pressure throughout the whole flow to make sure we're doing all the right things to be ready for it. All through late 2005, the flow of hardware becomes a flood of components arriving at Cape Canaveral. The Lockheed Martin Atlas V booster, The third stage rocket, built by Boeing. Flown in by the world's largest cargo plane, the giant fairings. The spacecraft itself is weighed to make sure no added mass will eat up fuel and reduce performance. I'll let him give me the final weight. We have to be polished and ready on the very first day of that window to go in order to get the best science, the best trip, maintain the highest fuel margins. We have to be ready to go on day one. One critical factor was not in the schedule. Late October and Hurricane Wilma approaches Cape Canaveral from the Gulf. The spacecraft is put back inside its protective can. Wilma is a Category 2 hurricane with winds as high as 94 miles per hour as it roars over Kennedy. There's 13 inches of rain. Siding is ripped off the shuttle assembly building. Damage overall is minimal, but one of the New Horizons solid rocket boosters has taken a hit. I think the hurricanes mostly caused a lot of extra work for the ground team, both the launch vehicle and the spacecraft team, because they had to take the time to pack things up. They had to take time away from their work to stand down during the hurricane. They took a little bit of damage and it's caused them um, uh, some time to catch up to replace the solid rocket booster that took a ding. Finally, time to lock the spacecraft inside the fairings that will protect it during launch. and a finishing touch, announcing new horizons to the world. Saturday, December 17th, 2005. Spacecraft and third stage in its closed up fairing, like a giant fragile egg, are placed on top of a huge transporter. With nine axles and 81 wheels, it's able to raise and lower itself to roll over bumps and up and down slopes without tilting the cargo. Working round the clock, they arrive at Pad 41 before dawn. Seventy-five years after the discovery of Pluto, seventeen years after a mission was first proposed, the dream of exploring the ninth planet was now only weeks from launch. For most people on the project, in a sense this is the end because it will be built and launched and on its way, but for the science team and the operations team, this is the beginning. This is where we begin the journey. Like a ship, we launch it. The final push towards launch has coincided with a burst of scientific discoveries. The news is breaking almost by the month. We're really revolutionizing our view of the outer solar system. At one point we thought there was only Pluto out there. Now, every other month it seems like we're discovering new worlds out there. In 2005, Hal Weaver and Alan Stern used the Hubble for another close-up look at Pluto and Charon. We want to know everything that could possibly be along our path as we're going through the Pluto-Charon system. The result was an historic and astonishing discovery. This was just incredible. In fact, it was so incredible we almost didn't believe it at first. They saw two small, dim moons where only Charon had been known before. 
it would double the excitement of the close encounter. We get uh, four for the price of two. You know, instead of uh, having just Pluto and Charon, we now have another couple of exciting moons to investigate. Pluto is an even more interesting place than we imagined. Mark Bowie went back and confirmed the discovery by reanalyzing previous images. He made this true color portrait of Pluto and its growing family of moons. The distances between them, of course, aren't accurate, but they're all the correct size and brightness. The new moons were tiny, but they posed another Pluto mystery. How could something that's only 70% of the size of the Earth's moon end up with three, three moons? Many astronomers believe that Pluto's system formed when two large and icy objects collided, forming the planet, Charon, and possibly other smaller moons. Studying the binary planet system of Pluto and Charon had already led astronomers to favor the idea that our own moon formed through a cataclysmic impact. And similarly, we think that the, uh, uh, the Earth-Moon system formed when a Mars-sized object uh, hit the proto-Earth. Pluto may be distant, but studying it, perhaps, may help us understand the origin and evolution of our own world. We think that uh, the process by which satellite systems form around other objects, around planets, uh, will be illuminated by having these new observations. The new moons and the ongoing discoveries out in the Kuiper Belt are evidence that exploration continues to expand our astronomical frontiers. To think that we're part of history, I mean, it was 27 years ago that James Christie at the Naval Observatory found Charon, you know, and then 75 years ago that Pluto itself was found, and then now we're, you know, adding on to that story and, uh, you know, really demonstrating that Pluto is this incredibly interesting place. Some astronomers have argued that since Pluto is an ice dwarf member of the Kuiper Belt, it should no longer be classified as a planet. Mike Brown, discoverer of Xena, the 10th planet, disagrees. Let's keep Pluto and let's draw the line underneath Pluto, say anything larger is a planet also. What that means, though, is that we probably will find a few more, and I actually think that's good. He thinks astronomical history is out here in the pluto charon system and the Kuiper Belt waiting to be made. There are a few more planets, and this generation will find a few more, and maybe the next generation will too. I think that's a very exciting proposition for everybody. The story of New Horizons may be a tale of high-powered rockets and sophisticated science instruments, but it's also evidence of human persistence, passion, and boundless imagination. And it's going to be an almost timeless object that we're building something that will not only outlast the pyramids, but outlast the mountain ranges of the Earth. This will fly through the galaxy essentially unchanged from the way we build it, but it will be just that way for billions of years, literally. That's a stunning thing to me every time I think about it. New Horizons is not just breakthrough science. It's another milestone in America's vision of space exploration. Humans are explorers. I mean, we're not satisfied just to sit still with the status quo. We want to understand our place in the universe. We want to understand why we're here. Is the Earth unique? Is life unique? And science, and in particular space science, where we're going out to study the planets, is a very important component of that process. Virtually every place we've sent a spacecraft on a first reconnaissance mission like this, that we find out that our Earth-based notions were flat wrong. So I'll tell you what we expect, but I, before anything, what we expect is to be surprised. The possibility of discovering something that nobody's ever seen before is very exciting. It doesn't come along every year, but when it does, that eureka moment is, is what scientists live for. In 2015, when the spacecraft is flying by Pluto, I, I hope to be in the Mission Operations Center uh, watching the first data come in as, as we do our first flyby of Pluto. I, I think that would be a spectacular place to be. Exploring the outer solar system, because it's so far, takes a lot of time. We're talking decades uh, rather than a few years. It requires a lot of patience, a lot of dedication, a lot of perseverance. but. It's exciting, it's the frontier, it's the place that we uh, know the least about and yet the rewards could be huge in terms of what it tells us about the origin and evolution of the solar system and because it's so far, we just want to know what's there. It's curiosity.